Mm. All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm some MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective Zooming Classroom. This is part five of the Vidya Prapta Paripricha Sutra, the questions of Bodhisattva Vidya Prapta, which means lightning attainment. Um, he, he had that name going into this sutra. And so, you know, he is full attainment now. This is the, the fifth and final installment in this sutra, which we will come to find out why it is called, also called, the Sutra on the Inexhaustible Hidden Treasuries. Hidden. We, we never knew they were there, right? That's kind of the idea. Um, again, this is part five. Refer to part one through four if you want to find out about the Bodhisattva's hidden treasury of practices concerning or about desire. Dealing with desire, dealing with desire, dealing with a desired filled world. The second hidden treasury of anger, dealing with anger, dealing with anger, dealing with an anger filled world. The third hidden treasury of delusion, moha, confusion, dealing with confusion, dealing with the confused, dealing with a confused world. And then we also opened up the fourth treasury which was this hidden treasury of an equal, a little equal mix, a little dash, a little dash of desire, a little dash of anger, and a little dash of delusion, right? A mi equal mix of all the kleshas or the afflictions. And tonight we are opening the fifth hidden treasury that we have been promised by the Buddha sitting on Mount Gridyakuta, the vulture's peak. He has promised this fifth hidden treasury of dharmas dharmas maybe all the dharmas sarva dharma all the dharmas so tonight's going to be a great conversation about dharmas in the plural like dharmas um we've got exciting places to go tonight and so i'm going to dive in again if 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 you uh, don't know who vidya prapta is i don't know what you're doing here you should be back <laughs> <laughs> a couple episodes ago, because the the Buddha, the Tathagata, the fully enlightened one, is about to uh, finish or conclude the answer to the the paripricha, the questions of Bodhisattva, lightning attainment. And so, in in this grand answer to the question of how does how do you Bodhisattva? How, like a verb. How do you bodhisattva? What is a, what are the practices of the bodhisattva? Well, the fifth hidden treasury of practices. Now, Vijaprapta, what is the bodhisattva's store or hidden treasury of wisdom of dharmas or the dharma? It is this. Bodhisattvas clearly see all forms as they really are. They know that they are uncreated from the beginning and pure in self nature. I'm going to stop there because <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's the answer. Um, this fifth treasury, you know, some of the other treasuries were pretty a little long-winded. Right? It was like pretty involved in the whole thing. This is this very, very simple statement. What's the Bodhisattva's hidden treasury of practices of all dharmas or of the dharma? It is these, this is, uh, you know, I mentioned Confucius last week and, and I have said, you know, we're, we're reading from the Chinese or uh, a translation of the Chinese. And so the Chinese here of, you know, this, this is it. Bodhisattvas 
clearly see all rupa, all form. And we're going to talk about form tonight is actually all about form or rupa, but bodhisattvas clearly see all form, all shape, all rupa as they really are, all form as it really is. They know that all forms are uncreated from the beginning and pure in self-nature. Bun uh, lai bu sheng, from the beginning, never arising. That's the first Chinese statement, from the beginning, never arising. This is the, the birthlessness of all things, the non-origination of all things, the non-origination of all dharmas. It's what we're here to talk about tonight as a little, you know, as the big concluding teaching of this sutra is this idea that ultimately all phenomena are without production, birth, origination. That's the first part, that they know that all forms are uncreated from the beginning, ban lai bu sheng, and pure in self nature. Uh, zhe xing, jing qing, uh, qing jing. From uh, zhe xing, this is a fascinating one, but a sel the self nature, the self nature of these dharmas, the self nature of all phenomena is pure, clear, uh, without defilement. Those are the ideas that we're playing with tonight. Um, there were some ideas hanging over from last week that I'm not even going to kind of really try to uh, uh, do tonight. I, I thought about it, but there's just too much to cover in the, the final treasury here. But this idea of all phenomena being originally by nature pure is this idea of vimala stainless or flawless and just to start us out tonight just to get us going quick you know to start priming the pump what we're talking about is this idea of you know desire you know bad desire bad desire Anger, bad anger, bad anger, delusion, bad delusion, right? Versus enlightenment, uh, knowledge, good knowledge, good enlightenment. Anger, uh, kindness, meta, good kindness, good meta, yes, good. Desire, no, giving, good giving, giving good. So the idea is, is that when we started this sutra, we were, we were concerned about the bad and interested in the good. We were like, ooh, you know, how can we get rid of the bad desire? How can we get rid of my bad anger? How can we get rid of my bad delusion? And what we're coming to realize in this teaching about the equality of the Dharmadhatu the equalization of all phenomena through this kind of portal of emptiness. The idea is that we come to realize, oh, wow, like all, the Buddha was talking about all phenomena, all dharmas. He was talking about all of them, not just these and those, like all phenomena being equal. Whoa, because it's by nature, it's a phenomena. <laughs> and all phenomena are kind of equally phenomenal. And by being phenomenal, it's sort of this, uh, you know, what the Buddha likes to call, right, an illusion, like a dream or a bubble, a shadow. These ideas, phenomenal. And in their phenomenality, in their phenomenalism, they're all equally phenomenal. They're all equally that. Even this idea of anger and greed and then giving and goodness, all these ideas are so phenomenal. So that within that realm of equality, the Dharma Dhatu, as the, the sutra has been calling it, this realm of reality, as it is often referred to in English, the Dharma Dhatu, 
all phenomena are zixing. Their their original nature is that they're totally pure, but not a dualistic bad good. They're all good, not a dualistic pure impure, but in equali, they're all equal in that sense. And therefore, you can't say blemished or not blemished. All phenomena are equally phenomenal in that way. And then there's the first part of this, which is this that they're they're ultimately non they're ultimately birthless, non-originating, right? That's sort of the um well, that's the that's the one. That's the one. And you know, yeah, I mean we have time, we got plenty of time tonight. This is a very short little section. So I'm gonna digress because there's gonna be so much um there's going to be so much about the idea of form, rupa. This is the first skandha. If you're familiar with the five skandhas, this is the first. Rupa usually refers to um, matter or traditionally, traditionally rupa was sort of the idea of that that which is composed of the four great elements, earth, fire, water, and air. And whether it's a rock or a tree or whatever, it has a certain portion of, of earthness, solidity, water, liquidity, uh, temperature. Everything has a temperature and that's the heat element or the fire element. And then everything is sort of animate or inanimate, moving or not moving. And therefore, having a fire, or sorry, an air element. The air element is sort of movement, fire is temperature, water is like fluidity, and earth is solidity. And again, you know, rocks are heavy on their earth element, not so much on their air element. And of course, human beings are a wild mix of temperature and air and all kinds of stuff, right? But the idea is, is that traditionally rupa or form kind of refer to matter, like, you know, stuff, <laughs> made of stuff, right? That's not quite what we're talking about. So if you're familiar with that idea of rupa and you think of the, the fifth skandha as rupa and you think of it as um, flesh or wood or whiteboard, you think of rupa as matter, Tonight, we need to take a step back from that idea, or we just need to get hip with what the sutra is going to be talking about regarding form, rupa. Tonight, rupa is actually the, the corresponding media, sense media, of vision, of the eyes that the eyes perceive form. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this from the beginning, even though the sutra says it later on. The sutra later on says, everything that we're about to talk about goes for auditory forms, olfactory forms, uh, taste formations, and tactile formations. Tactile form, smooth, rough, hot, cold, tac tactile sensations. Tonight, it, this is convenient for our Zoom world. Tonight, we're exclusively going to be talking about the world of visual form. Shape, color, number type stuff. That which is perceived by the eye. And it's, it's important for me to preface this with this idea that like, all of the analogies that are about to come, all of this thinking that we're about to do regarding form, rupa, it's about vision, sight, like with the eyeballs in a way. And to give you like just a, um, I guess a, a visual, to give you a visual for, for how to think of this right, we're, ta we're talking about like CCTV, closed caption television, no audio, just like you're an eyeball in a jar. 
and you all you have is the ability to discern via visual formation. You do not have a body to go touch it and determine its uh, sort of three dimensionality in that way or to determine its tactility. You don't have a nose, you don't have a tongue, you don't have ears, so you're not even uh, echolocuting at the most subtle levels. It also to give you a sense of three dimensionality, right? That's also part of echolocution is it provides within this 3D world, of course, it provides a deeper sense of dimensionality. If we're just in this 2D, uh, we're just that eye, oh, woo, like, you know, think of that. If you're just an eyeball, all you have to go, all you have to go on is like shape. <laughs> Right, and what I mean by that is, so tonight's prop, I'm going back to my, to the, the 45 record, the, the Menahan, Menahan Street Band, Make the Road by Walking. We're going back there. And if you were, you know, let's say you were cognizant, a cognizant eyeball in that jar of fluid, based on the form of this, you would quote, kind of know what it is. Literally, the shape, the shape, the color, which is this kind of black versus a, a solid, that actually is a definite indicator of a 45, uh, you know, vinyl record, right? So this shape, and then of course, if I was like, you would, oh, you're sold, you're sold, because it's flat, circular, hole in the middle, all of that, right? And so, so that I don't have to hold up my 45 all night, I draw my, my Rupa Records hit, my Rupa Records dynamite hit, right? All dharmas. But this is sort of the idea of form as, um, well, just that idea of discernment, of what would be called samya or perception, that the eyeball is sort of like uh, creating that sense of what things are using the form or the shape, right? And so in particular, this sutra just said that all rupa, all rupa is originally non-produced or without birth, birthless, um, uncreated from the beginning. And all forms, all shapes are originally by their self nature in that sense, pure. And so in order to go a little further with this idea of like, what are they talking about with form or shape? I wanna go back to this example, another form, another shape. It's how you know what something is, right? But this is a little simpler because this is just, you know, arguably three, arguably three lines, two lines, one line. But the idea is, is that this is indeed a form or a shape. But as I talked about um, in the past, and I probably is worth repeating in case, you know, just to get us all on the same page, the Buddhists sort of talk about these three kind of realms of reality that we move in. And one of them is the realm of, of significance or meaning. And in that realm, this letter kind of looks more like this in your mind. Meaning that when you see the shape, right? Insofar as it is the letter A, it kind of has all those other letters secretly floating around it. Insofar as it's the letter A. So keep that in mind in terms of significance and meaning. The significance and meaning of things are actually somehow like, well, they're complex. And what I mean by that is, is that if we were to take a trip, let's take a trip out of the Kamadatu, right? And let's take a trip to the realm of just pure form. 
And in the realm of pure form, you know, is it a A or a, a D, right? It's like, it's just kind of a shape, right? But the idea is, is that if you, if you turn it just the right way and look at it just the right way, you can see it as just a shape. Kind of, I, I don't want to quite say meaningless because, you know, meaning is, is, is deep. But you can kind of, in a way, abandon the significance and meaning of the letter A and just arrive at the black and the white, this sort of realm of pure form. That, just that alone is where we want to stay. I'm not even going to take us into the formless realm and all that tonight where we totally abandon all, you know, meaning and significance. I want to stay right in that nice, sweet spot of just form. But with a little bit of vacillation into the world of meaning and significance, and then an even deeper trip into the world of meaning and significance and relativity, where letters are related to numbers, colors are related to other colors, all shapes are related to all other shapes in that way. So this sort of like wild Dharma Dhatu kind of realm where we're going to be toggling or vacillating between the realm of desire, which is the realm of desire, which is the realm of significance and meaning, versus just this kind of realm of form and shape. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's a good primer for, for the rest. Questions or ideas about form, why, like anything about this idea? Please, Gnome. Gnome's, yeah. Um, you said that what we talk about regarding form as being that which is perceived by the eye has equivalence with each of the other senses. Yep. But you didn't mention the mind. I didn't. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Noam, because of course, as good Dharma students, we are aware that within this kind of uh, science of the mind, the Buddhist science of the mind, they recognize six sensory organs the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and then basically the brain may include the whole central nervous system in the brain. We don't need to get technical. But the idea is, is that, that that thinking organ that is like, uh, remember the 45 record? Remember the 45 I held up? It's, we're not having a visual of it anymore. I'm asking you to recall it with your sixth sense organ. I'm asking you to imagine the circular, remember the hole, remember it had the green, remember it had the black, remember it was about this big. Insofar as you're ruminating or contemplating that 45 record, that's a, uh, a mental dharma or a mental phenomena. The one that I showed you was a visual phenomena. My voice is an auditory phenomena and so on. So thanks for mentioning the sixth organ. That one's tricky though. That one's tricky. And it indeed, by the time we're at the end of the sutra, we'll be wrestling with that sixth organ. But this is training wheels. So we start off with like eyeball, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tanya. Um, so at the beginning, you, well, you were talking about like birthlessness and that, um, you know, everything has pure self nature um, and that the, all phenomena are not produced, they're birthless, they're not created. Then what about like codependent or uh, codependent or dependent origination? Because things, because that's because that's things pinging off of each other and becoming right yes yes and there is a very 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 subtle difference between the teaching on dependent origination and this kind of dharma dot to um like what what i always call the monolithic whole of reality the the what the one chapter called the uh, concatenation of all events in the universe 
This is a little deeper than dependent origination. And the reason why I say that is, is that within the world of dependent origination, you kind of, I mean, and as the Buddha so eloquently put, when you have this, you have that. You can't have a this without a that. This is make that's. That's make this is. They're, 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 they're built into it. There, there's this, just this wild kind of thing and it's built into the mind and language that as soon as you have a this, it sort of secretly implies a that. As soon as you have a this, it secretly implies the that, the others. Now, dependent origination is sort of like, well, there's this and so there's that. This is saying this is that, that is this. And, and I know that that just got really, really uh, recursively <laughs> self like, but I, you know, that's it's, the, it's just, it's like, the whole, <laughs> like the whole of, of reality or of, yeah. of existence or whatever. Yeah, and there's a beautiful okay. phrase that they call it the interpenetration of all dharmas. That not only do all dharmas depend on all other dharmas, but that ultimately all dharmas sort of interpenetrate one another in that way. They're, they are all each other. And of course, leave it to the Chinese to come up with that beautiful yin-yang symbol where at the heart of the black is actually the white dot and at the heart of the white is the black dot because you cannot have one without the other. And that is that deep lesson of the binary nature of the yin yang is that actually at the very core of yin is yang and at the very core of yang is yin. So yeah, it's a, it's a subtly deeper level. This part, this part five. Jenny, did you, Jenny, did you have, I saw you. Yeah, and I think I was just saying what Tanya was saying about like um, all pheno phenomena being pure has no origination. So then if I'm understanding what then just happened, so if this is dependent on that and that's dependent on this, then it's all one and therefore it just is. Okay. Everything is everything, as Lauren Hill said. Yep. Okay. So again, that's the sutra. That was just to get us on the same page that we're talking about visual form and how all visual formations are ultimately pure by nature. And we're going to eventually get to the birthlessness of them. If you're not there already because these were amazing questions that elicited those ideas. So the treasury, the hidden treasury of all dharmas is that, that view that non, the birthlessness of all things and the ultimate purity of all things, right? Because bodhisattvas have thorough understanding of rupa, of forms, they can achieve the four elements of unimpeded eloquence. What are the four elements of unimpeded eloquence? They are unhindered understanding of all meaning, the unhindered knowledge of all dharmas, the unhindered use of all languages, and the unhindered ability to discourse, but actually it is the unhindered ability at pleasurable discourse, pleasant, pleasing, happy discourse. That is the fourth element of this idea of unhindered eloquence. So we're going to pause there for a moment. Um, this is an idea that we've seen come up a number of times in our in our mining experience of the, the, the heap of jewels, the Ratnakuta Sutra, this collection of sutras, we've come across this idea of the Bodhisattva achieving 
and it's an achievement. It's an attainment. You don't start off with this, but you develop this unhindered eloquence. Um, definitely based on the Sanskrit, definitely based on the Chinese. Uh, not going to get into either of those languages, but what they are clearly talking about speech. Like this is eloquence, this is, this is speaking. And if I may, just to kind of try to tie in my, my motif tonight, this kind of MC Owens classic DJ motif, I do believe that by unhindered eloquence, this is something like freestyle rapping. This is something like some really, uh, what would be called what, like ecstatic poetry type stuff. Like really, really, um, uh, I, yeah, freestyle. F like really f uh, flow state, I guess, would be a neologism I could employ. But this idea of unhindered eloquence seems to be this sort of ability to really go like really really go and not only that um the eloquence part this ability to to to, to discourse right these four the buddha tells us that the the element of unhindered understanding of all meaning is the perfect understanding of the meaning of all visible forms. What is the meaning of all visible forms, you may ask? It is the same as the ultimate truth. What is the ultimate truth, you may ask? It is the inapprehensibility of all forms. Acquiring an understanding of this ultimate truth is called the unhindered understanding of all meaning. Okay, I'm going to go by through these one by one just to, because they each have their own interesting idea. So I employed my language analogy my letter analogy for a reason and it's because well i mean this could this could get really really deep this could get really deep in terms of well there's a lot of kind of quote po uh, postmodern philosophy or postmodern thinking that you know is sort of about the idea of the world as language and what i mean by that is is that yeah we have these letter ideas that make up these word things that make up these sentences things that make up these idea structure things but there's a way of sort of seeing visible formations there's a way of seeing um there's a way of seeing visible forms as a type of uh, uh, language. And if you know how to read, and I don't mean read the clock, I don't mean read the hands and the numbers, that would still be um, symbolic language. This postmodern idea of seeing the world as language is this idea of seeing how this particular shape formation, this particular shape formation, that these shape formations are sort of like, um, well, this is kind of like a letter in the, in, the, in the alphabet of like record player, needle, hi-fi, stereo system, speakers, like that whole language of that, this is kind of a letter in that structure. And so one starts to see or can start to see all, again, all phenomena as sort of either symbolically like language or letters in a larger sentence structure and all of that. It gets really wild. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, really here to go down that road. It was just that if anybody's on that tip of, of that, <laughs> seeing the world as language, this 
section right here is sort of talking about that. It's sort of talking about the bodhisattvas um, at this level. But and this is the fifth. This is this is the last part. So we're at the pinnacle of attainments as far as this sutra is concerned. And so the bodhisattva at this point understands the meaning of everything. Understands the meaning of all the language. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I don't know how many languages you speak. I, you know, I kind of pretend to speak a few. I speak English okay. Uh, but this language, all language is a really wild idea. And so what they're talking about is this really high level of attainment of understanding and knowledge where, or I should say wherein, the, the significance of all phenomena is understood. And if you refer to last week's conversation about understanding the minds of all sentient beings and this idea that if you understand these basic principles of psychology, you can understand the minds of all sentient beings because you understand the principles at work. So this is sort of saying that at this level of attainment, you understand how meaning works. And therefore, it, all meaning is very uh, clear in that sense. Um, yeah, I sort of basically, in, in my own way, tried to paraphrase this idea that the unhindered understanding of all meaning is the perfect understanding of the meaning of all visible forms, all rupa. And what is the meaning of all visible forms or all rupa? It's the same as the ultimate truth. <laughs> and what is the ultimate truth? It is the inapprehensibility of all phenomena. And that, of course, is the deepest teaching here, which is that the, the going and grasping after these phenomena is, is a, it's a losing game in that way. Um, it's folly. It's diluted in that sense because they're all dependently originated in that way. They're all equally. Uh, so the, the, you're like, no, I want just this. I don't want that. I want just the yang. I want just a yang energy. Just a yang. I don't want no yin. You can't. You sorry. I'm sorry. You you don't get to. You get. You only have the one, <laughs> or you only have the one. Only have the one. Okay. Any questions about the one? This is the unhindered understanding of all meaning. And I know I always block this cor corner. It's a, it's a small uh, Dharma playhouse I'm in, but this is a, also, this is sometimes translated as interpretation. And, and I guess the reason why I went off on my whole like Benjaminian, if you know Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, he talks a lot about that idea of the world as language. The reason why I went off on that is that there's a way to read this where they're like, oh, bodhisattvas and Buddhists, yeah, they can, they can read any book in any language. But if you go further, they're actually talking about understanding all visible, all visible formations, which might be symbols as we know them, or they might be 45 records in that way. So <laughs> that's the first one. Um, number two, the, the other element, the second element to unhindered, Freestyle eloquence is the unhindered knowledge of all dharmas. The unhindered knowledge of all dharmas is the thorough knowledge of all visible forms, which results from accurate observation of them. This is sort of um, any one of these, of course, we could spend all night on. This is going to begin to introduce this sort of very plural sense of dharmas. So the meaning of all visible forms, great, great. Uh, meaning of all visible forms, great. Now we're at the, the sort of the, the understanding or having unhindered knowledge of all dharmas. So this is not um, symbolic language. This is deep, um, deep truths, very, very deep truths, like the relationship between attachment and suffering. 
my hands, the attachment, the clinging, my, my, uh, the, the visible formations of all of that. That's what we were talking about a second ago. Now we're talking about these sort of principles. They're called dharmas. These principles that are at work in the world, desire, anger, delusion, the 12 link chain of causation, the four noble truths, the five skandhas. I could be here all night reciting numerous, numerous enumerated dharmas. But the idea is, is that this second level is about having unhindered understanding of all the dharmas, all the teachings, all the knowledge. That's number two. <laughs> Good on number two. So number one sort of seems like elementary school now <laughs> compared to number two. Because number one was just like puppet show, shadow puppet theater. Number two, though, is a little deeper. Number three, very, very interesting. The third element in unhindered eloquence is the unhindered use of all language. The unhindered use of all language is the skillful or upayak use of language in presenting visual forms in all ways with unobstructed wisdom with unobstructed wisdom. So a moment ago I mentioned there is one way to read the first element of this, which is that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can read all languages. Well, this third one is actually about how Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can supposedly speak all languages. Uh, forget polyglot. This is all languages. And if you have been following along in terms of the, the requisites of element number one and number two, this third one should be like, well, yeah, I guess that would, be, that would go along with the other ones then, I guess, if they have this sort of unhindered freestyle awareness and knowledge of all meaning and all dharmas. So then the idea is you get this sort of idea that for expediency's sake, for upaya's sake, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, knowing the mentalities of all sentient beings, like, hablas espanol, right? Let's go, vamanos, let's go in Spanish, and so on and so on. So that's part of the idea here. Jenny, Jenny's excited about unhindered knowledge of all languages. Yeah, because I wonder if in translation, languages is mm. actually able to communicate in the 84,000 different ways to communicate the idea versus Spanish versus German versus that, did that make sense? Not only did it make sense, it's exactly what I'm, what I was, that's exactly what I was gonna say. And what I, what I mean by that is, is that I, I said before that some people, translate the first one as like Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can read all languages, but I kind of bumped it up to they can read everything. They have on, I'm with you, Jenny, that I think it's like, yeah, it might be Spanish or German. It might be ASL. It might be a wink. Uh, that's the idea. Exactly. That it's about communication. That might be silence. That might be gestural. Who knows? But I do think that we should pause for a moment on, um, well, I guess just pause for a moment on the, the progression here, which is sort of number one is sort of this, this passive understanding of symbols this way. And then the dharmas is like this passive understanding of all meaning and like truth. The third one is, is about this sort of, communication if if we will but i i'm with i agree entirely that it may not necessarily be languages as, as such so hey michael the question that i have is like do they give uh, or does the text also give not not necessarily a reason but um mm. um but in 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 the sense of um because there is only 
one mind um, or Dharma Tattoo or, you know, they're often they mm. in, uh, in a contemporary um, school of thoughts to talk about the cloud of memories, you know, yes. memory yep. cloud or something. Is this what it goes back to? Mm. No? Or is this too much out there? That's, I mean, it's very out there. Mm. It's very, it's a very, very good question. I actually believe because of some, you know, various things that I've learned about Tibetan Buddhism and other types of uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, there is this kind of Akashic record idea of all of this and the one mind idea, which I'm, you know, often, I, I often evoke the idea of the one mind and one consciousness idea and all of that. But for this one, just because of this whole, the, the structure here, I do think it's about sort of understanding like, oh, it's really subtle. It, it, it is very deep, Connie, but it's like, it's kind of the idea of dependent origination, but in a slightly like just a, a just a b it's a b-side to the dependent origination in that way but it's like all all forms of discrimination are are equal and so and it's some they they can appear huge like me from you <laughs> oh my god that separates the whole world into subject and object right or it can be this it can be separating this from that it can be separating this but there's a way that within samsara, within delusion, within this world of confusion about the Dharma Dhatu, um, there's this way in which, I mean, if since the whole world is this sort of discriminated game of, of this from that and da da da, wow, there, I mean, I've, um, there's so much to learn. I, I better get busy. How many degrees, how many master's degrees, PhDs would I need to learn it all? I would need to go to school forever and read every book and read. That's a deluded way of thinking of knowledge and all of this. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the eye of wisdom, the mind of wisdom that understands, understands that all discriminative, discriminatory activity is equally discriminative and discriminatory. And so if you get right to the heart of it and kind of really touch it, it's all the same. Because and they are all from, they, um, they are rooted from the same nature, exactly. nature of, nature of existence or nature of appear, not existence, but maybe nature of appearances or nature of phenomena. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect mm -hmm. words, <laughs> appearance and phenomena mm -hmm. for the, ph the phenomenology of it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Okay, number four, the fourth element of unhindered eloquence is the ability to discourse pleasantly. I want to emphasize this in the Sanskrit and the Chinese. It's actually about it being fun and it's pleasant. All right, so it's not just about this sort of ability to go all night. You know, we can talk about this all night. It, it's not unhindered ability to discourse, but particularly this unhindered ability to pleasantly discourse, and that is the ability to reveal and discourse upon all rupa, upon all visible forms, to sentient beings according to their propensities <clears throat> without being attached to them or affected oneself. After achieving this understanding, bodhisattvas can, with effortless wisdom, expound the Dharma properly to all sentient beings who cling to visual, visible forms. They do this in accordance with their natures, the natures of sentient beings, and, the na and their desires. While the bodhisattvas themselves have no dualistic view of the Dharma. They can also explain the Dharma in the same way to those same sentient beings who are attached to sounds, scents, tastes, textures, and dharmas, ideas. 
Vijaprapta, this is what is meant by a great bodhisattva's hidden treasury of the Dharma. In order to subdue sentient beings deluded by sensual objects, bodhisattvas who have acquired this hidden treasury of wisdom can, for a kalpa or more, use various terms to teach the 12 entrances skillfully, the 12 link chain of causation skillfully, in accordance with the wishes of all sentient beings. While the bodhisattva's attachment to the 12 entrances, the 12 link chain of causation, or oh, sorry, while sentient beings' attachment to the links in the 12 link chain are infinite, Bodhisattva's wisdom is also inexhaustible. And because they never deviate from the non dual, undifferentiated Dharma Dhatu, but always conform to it. This is the Bodhisattva's skillful exposition of the non differentiation of all Dharmas. Once bodhisattvas acquire this hidden treasury of all dharmas, they can then teach the dharma to sentient beings properly, causing them to possess fully the inexhaustible dharma treasury and be free from the poverty of samsara forever. Okay. That's sort of the end of the sutra like the the sutra proper which is the discourse on the five hidden treasuries questions answers ideas or comments before i add a little in um commentary very good i want to talk before we dive in to the last part i want to talk about the hidden treasuries this is an idea that may have just like whoop just go right past you so i want to make sure we're, we all got it these these five teachings on desire anger delusion an equal mix of those kleshas and then all dharmas these have been called by the buddha these hidden treasuries in fact they've actually been called inexhaustible hidden treasuries so inexhaustible again is this great buddhist idea of like a fire you could feed the fire forever and it would just <sighs> inexhaustible inexhaustible hidden treasuries and i think just because we're a little low on time and i do want to finish the sutra and i have a few other ideas to add to the end of this i want to just make clear this idea of the hiddenness that where oh, where are they hiding <laughs> What's going, where, you know, the idea, as I understand it, and this is total interpretation commentary in that way, but I think what the sutra is sort of saying is, is that for the, the deluded discriminatory mind that likes this, but doesn't like that and wants to be here and doesn't want to be there and, you know, has all of this discrimination and it's not, you know, these discriminations we keep, I keep referring to. It's not, it doesn't have to be as gross and nasty as like racial discrimination. It's really more subtle than that. Just separating things out, you know, like discriminating in, in any way. And this sutra, as far as I can tell, is saying that when one does that, well, it's like, well, if I, you know, if I put all of this over here as bad and I'm just trying to maximize my little good over here, it's like, well, then I got just this to work with and I, and all of that's kind of off limits, <laughs> but in the hidden treasury way, it's like, Oh no, it's all up for grabs in a way. You didn't even know that you could use all of this. And so since all the dharmas are up for grab, that's where they become inexhaustible and they're hidden nature. Cause they're here, they're right here, but not for the deluded mind. Of course, that's sort of this, uh, lightning attainment understanding, of course, that all dharmas are non-produced and equal, equally pure in that way. 
questions about that, the hidden nature of these things, right? It's sort of, again, just about the discriminatory mind sort of cuts off a big chunk of reality, a huge giant chunk of reality and says, nah, uh uh, uh, just this. And when one is liberated from such clinging discriminatory, uh, you know, ways of thinking, it's in that way. Okay. Again, that's going to be more or less the bulk of the teaching. Shall I finish up? Cool. So when this doctrine, this teaching of the hidden treasuries was explained, Bodhisattva, oh sorry, Bodhisattva Vidyaprapta achieved Dharani. 500 other Bodhisattvas achieved the Lightning Samadhi. And 36,000 gods brought forth Supreme Bodhicitta, the determination for enlightenment. And at that time, the Bodhisattva Moon Banner, Moon Banner, said to the Buddha, World Honored One, you have now mentioned several times effortless wisdom. What does that mean? The Buddha said, if bodhisattvas inclined with inclined in body and mind to if bodhisattvas inclined in body and mind to practice wholesome dharmas and they cling to one thing after the other while performing those dharmas this is called effort. Bodhisattvas are said to possess effortless wisdom if they can do the following. Remain flexible in body and mind. Be free of thought. Rely on nothing. Manifest no sign of practice make all kinds of manifestations in thousands of millions of billions of Buddha lands by means of the wisdom resulting from the fulfillment of their past vows while remaining unmoved in the Dharmadhatu. Teach the Dharma constantly without entering any notion of the Dharma. Employ the four means of unification to bring sentient beings to maturity without ever thinking that there are any sentient beings to be liberated. To beautify and purify all Buddha lands without regarding any Buddha land as impure and needing a purification. Be always mindful of Buddhas without seeing them as they may physically appear. And traverse all Buddha lands without ever moving in the Dharma Dhatu. By achieving such wisdom, bodhisattvas can satisfy all the wishes of sentient beings without being attached to what they do. Then the world honor one told Bodhisattva Vijaprapta, the Tathagatas, the worthy ones, the supremely enlightened ones of the past, revealed and explained this doctrine here. And future Buddhas will also appear here in the world to expound this doctrine. The present Buddhas, Tathagatas, in the numberless, incalculable worlds are now shedding this great light to celebrate the continuity of this doctrine. Thereupon, Venerable Ananda rose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt on his right knee, joined his palms, and asked the Buddha, World Honored One, what shall this suture be named, and how should we uphold it? The Buddha told Ananda, This sutra is named the inexhaustible hidden treasuries of wisdom or 
a discourse on the non-differentiation of all dharmas. These are the names by which you should uphold it. When the Buddha had spoken this sutra, Bodhisattva Vijaprapta, Venerable Nanda, and the four kinds of devotees, the monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen, and all of the gods, humans, asuras, gandharavas, asuras, garudas, kimnaras, maharagas, and other beings of the world were jubilant. They accepted the sutra with faith and began to practice it with great veneration. Svaha. Yay. Perfect. Okay. That's the Vijapatta Paripricha Sutra. Uh, uh, questions about any of it, you know, all the way back to one, part one, part two, part three, four, whatever. Any questions about that last part? There were a lot of crazy ideas actually that were dropped at that last part. So, uh, hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, at the last part, we actually got what we were promised in the beginning, right? Uh, and yeah, in all senses, in, in all possible senses. Uh, uh, one in particular, more, more that I was noticing, how come we attain the Dharanis? I, th I used to think of Dharanis as incantations. Or in what mm. sense are they used when uh, mm. everybody achieved these uh, dharanis? That's a great question. Um, I'm a big. Um, I have. A, I am very interested in dharanis. Uh, these are a really interesting Buddhist uh, later Mahayana phenomena. The sutra says that once this doctrine of the inexhaustible treasuries was explained, it was the the Bodhisattva Vijaprapta who achieved Dharani. And yeah, usually Dharanis are, are called spells, incantations. Um, when I first started learning and reading about Dharanis, it was sort of like, well, mantras are like a syllable or a word. Dharanis are like a sentence, you know, or Dharanis are a little longer. And so they're kind of like these long mantras. And indeed, if you if you look into Dharanis and, and study them, they they are very mantra esque. They they usually have the either like a kind of an Om or a Nam Namo, and then this kind of long chant and all of this. But there's a lot more to Dharanis. Um, they're an, an a word. An English word that I think might be appropriate for translating Dharanis is mnemonics. Mnemonics are, a, that's a modern idea, but this idea of having, well, let's say you have a sentence with 10 words. If you were to take the first syllable of each of those words and make a word, that was the first syllable of each as a mnemonic, almost like a memory palace type of a thing, you would be able to unpack the whole sentence because of the cue of the mnemonic of the first syllable. It seems to me that Dharani's function as mnemonics where basically what it would seem is that there's a Dharani for this sutra and it's the whole sutra in a, in a incantation. And if you were to read the incantation, it would make no sense. But if, if you got the last part of it, of course, it would make all sense, right? So, so do you think then that all of these lists and matricas are Dharanis as well? I do believe that Dharanis are a kind of an offshoot of the matrika tradition. The matrika being these matrices, which are the, the lists of teachings and then lists within lists within lists. That's a very, well, it's a very Buddhist way of, of thinking, that kind of embeddedness, nested embeddedness. I mean, these, these wild ideas of all language being contained in each letter of all language, 
is kind of a philosophical flowering of a kind of just a Buddhist way of thinking, which is very matrix oriented in that way. And so, yeah, I think that there was a Matrika tradition, which was about, I mean, even, you know, just to, to put it out there, even the enumerated teachings, like the five skandhas, the six this, the seven that, that's a form of this uh, memory palace. Because it's like, well, I know there's five skandhas. I got form, sensation, perception, conditioning. I know there's another one, you know. And so there's all these beautiful poetic type mnemonics already. And Durrani seemed to be this um, tantric, borderline Vajrayana technique of distilling tremendous amounts of information, even entire sutras, into these little, put it in your, you know, just carried around with you. And then you could like pop, 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 unpack the whole thing. Mm -hmm. No, and I finally understood with all this uh, study that we did about meaning, how precisely those instruments of images, recitations, objects work precisely because you understand the power of, of symbols and meaning. Exactly. Thanks, Eric. That was great. Any other um, questions, ideas, comments? There's a few in here I'll do. If... So I just wanted to go through just that list real quick. That was um, that if bodhisattvas, um, I wanted to repeat this part about effortless wisdom, where it says that if bodhisattvas that are inclined in body and mind, they're inclined to practice wholesome dharmas right like don't do the unwholesome practice wholesome dharmas and they cling to one thing after another while performing those unwhole or sorry while performing those wholesome dharmas that's called effort <laughs> bodhisattvas are said to possess effortless wisdom if they can do the following remain flexible in body and mind, be free of thought. So flexible in body and mind, sure, you know, good asana never hurt anybody, right? But they're also talking about this flexibility of the mind, this sort of not rigid, clinging, you know, partisan type thinking, more flexible, more loose than that. In fact, they should be free from thought. And I would, I would suggest if you were like, what, do you, what does the Buddha mean that a bodhisattva should be free from thought? Well, if we're talking about freestyle, freestyle thinking, off the dome piece thinking knowledge, not premeditated in any way, shape or form, that's talking about premeditated thought. That's talking about those sort of like the inner chatter of like, when are they gonna stop talking so I can say the thing? Cause I, I've got this great idea. I got this great, I can't wait to say the thing. That's the thought that the Bodhisattva should probably not be kind of participating in versus the, the mirror-like reflectivity that we talked about last week. So that's the idea of being free of thought. Relying on nothing. That's the next one. Rely on nothing. That's a very, very profound idea not relying on anything. And I guess like, you know, there's so many ways that we could talk about that idea. Very, very deep, very deep, like depend, basically dependent origination type stuff, right? Uh, bodhisattva born, you know, born victorious type stuff from last time. But for right now, just for this little recap, that, that bodhisattvas rely on nothing I would, I would suggest sort of thinking about concepts of independence. And, I, and I'm not even talking like moksha, liberation, independence. I'm talking about like, you know, being like dependent on your parents as, a, as like a kid. You're dependent on your parents. And then you reach a certain point where you are no longer reliant upon your parents. Congratulations. You, you made it, right? You're not reliant upon them. Maybe you're not reliant upon the state. 
for unemployment insurance. Maybe you're not reliant upon this, this, or that. We are reliant upon lots of things. But I want you to see how there's an interesting relationship between, well, dependence and reliance in that way, and then independence and freedom on the flip side that not relying on anything is a form of freedom and independence because you're not dependent on those things. And so bodhisattvas in their magnanimous wisdom are not reliant on anything. <laughs> Even all the way up to their very thought mind thinking processes in that way. The next one is that they manifest no sign of practice. Uh, again, it's another one we could be here all night dissecting, but the idea is, is that it's like, um, you know, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it. They, they don't, they don't have, you know, they manifest no signs of practice. I mean, you know, it's, you wouldn't know it. Um, but I'm also, I mean, funny, but what I, what I mean is, is, this idea of like they don't put a show on it's not about this performance of it it's about the doing of it they show no signs of trying to do it <laughs> right in that sense Manif manifesting no sign of practice we could be here all night but i just give you that little taste of the idea that they uh they sort of don't they you wouldn't know it They make all kinds of manifestations in thousands of millions of billions of Buddha lands by means of the wisdom resulting from the fulfillment of their past vows while remaining unmoved in the Dharma Dhatu. <laughs> so that's, now we're getting real astral. Now we're getting really astrally wild because the idea is that the Bodhisattva visits innumerable thousands upon billions of Buddha lands while remaining perfectly unmoved within the Dharmadatsu. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a, just a feeling that you might have about that mirror-like surface of reality and how if you really penetrate that mirror-like surface of reality, well, you know, like George Harrison said, you can know the whole world without leaving your house in that way, right? You can know the whole world just looking out your windows sort of idea. <laughs> Bodhisattvas teach the Dharma constantly without entertaining any notion of the Dharma. So that's a wild one. That's like, whoa, they're out there, what? Doing what? They're, 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 Teaching the Dharma without any conception of the Dharma, right? And that would just kind of get back to what I was have been talking about all night about non-discrimination, not discriminating this from that. So bodhisattvas are in the business of not discriminating the mirror-like surface of the Dharma Dhatu. But when they're in the business of chatting with sentient beings, they might appear to be discriminating within the Dharma Dhatu to present to you various forms. Yeah? The one that I wanted to get to, they teach the Dharma constantly without entertaining, oh, sorry, that, that one I just did. They employ the four means of unification to bring sentient beings to maturity without thinking that there are any beings to be liberated. <laughs> so if you weren't here for some of my past Dharma talks, there is this beautiful idea in the Mahayana tradition that doesn't get talked about as much as it should and that is this idea of the four means of unification, the four means of bringing people together into cohesion and community is giving, dana, kind speech, volunteerism, and cooperation. <laughs> so volunteerism, of course, is is volunteering your body and your time to some enterprise that isn't your enterprise, it's somebody else's enterprise, but you're gonna volunteer and help. Cooperation is, we're working on this together, exchanging kind speech all the way and exchanging giving in that way. Those are the four means of unification. Bodhisattvas do that, but without 
thinking that there are any beings to be liberated. So vol volunteering for what? For who? Cooperating with who? Kindly speaking to who? Giving what to whom? That's sort of the bodhisattva paradox is that they are involved in this activity, but without having any notions that that activity is going on. One of my personal favorites, bodhisattvas beautify and purify all Buddha lands without regarding any Buddha land as impure. <laughs> this is a whole, um, it's a whole Mahayana idea that I'm kind of interested in exploring more, which is the bodhisattvas beautifying Buddha lands with adornments. And this is a really interesting idea because what a sutra, what a Mahayana text will do is that they will create this beautiful teaching about like the purity, the innate purity of things or something like that, or the non-origination of all things. And that, that, is a, it beautifies the world. It's an adornment of the world. It's along the same lines as how we describe all of this as like jewels. This, these, these, these truths, these teachings are like jewels and they beautify the world, right? This, this teaching of the four means of unification is an adornment to this world. And so you get into this really poetic, beautiful bodhisattva language of beautifying the world with truth, beautifying the world with loving kindness and compassion, but all the while not holding the view that the world needs purification in any way. There's nothing wrong with the world. That's, that's a Dharma jewel right there that I'm trying to, to decorate the world with just now, right? Right, you see how it might, it might become an infinite regression there, right? Everybody good? Michael? Yeah. Um, I have a question about, and I love what you just said, but especially in the previous one, the giving without there being anyone to give to, I, I was kind of connecting that to uh, a, like a non, without attachment to outcome. And, and they, is that, that's a huge part of it. That's a huge part of it, Noam. And man, that makes my mind go wild thinking about it because it's so layered. Because we, you, you could think of it at a very mundane uh, level in terms of like a, a tax refund, right? And it's like only doing it because I'm going to get my tax refund. You, are you a 501c3? I want to make sure you're a 501c3 first because I got to get my tax refund. And mm -hmm. so that would be this sort of defiled giving where it's like you said, yeah. like about uh, the outcome, right? But on, on that, am I muted? <laughs> oh no, sorry, because I saw the little mute. It's like, am I be talking to nobody on there? <laughs> I, would, I would say then the, the more deeper level about that idea is this... Um, uh, that what is what the sutras actually often talk about is the punya, the mm. merit, mm. doing it for the merit, mm. doing it so that I get a better rebirth, doing it because I go, I'm going to go to heaven. That's the same as a tax return. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't believe in heaven anymore. We re believe in tax returns type of a thing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter because whether it's one or the other, your, your observation gnome is spot on in terms of that idea that it's a, it's a much more immediate and therefore kind of pure act in that way. Mm -hmm. Totally. Any other questions, ideas, comments? I just wanted to touch on a few more of those ideas from that nice juicy paragraph that bodhisattvas also are always mindful of Buddhas without seeing them as they physically appear. 
this is a pretty classic idea. I've I've mentioned this a lot from the it's a line from the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, a famous one, where it says uh, the Buddha recites a, a poem or a gatha, and he says if if I am if I am seen by sight or sought by sound, you're 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 it's the wrong way, it's the wrong path. That's the the paraphrase of the quote. But what's really interesting about this idea of bodhisattvas um, uh, being always smrti or sati, mindful of Buddhas, but without seeing them as they physically appear. And this is deep, but, you know, this is deep. This is a really deep idea. It's a Mahayana idea, of course, about not saying, oh, Buddhas? Yeah, they have Ushnishas, they are male, they have the 32 marks, they look like this, they, they're da 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 da, that's a Buddha. And sorry, you, you failed the Buddha test if you think that Buddhas are perceived by their physical form in that way. And if I can make an analogy that might be interesting, it's the idea of like, say, Jesus, right? What, is, what does Jesus look like? What is Jesus' physical form? And is it, are you able to imagine Jesus not in a physical form in that sense? And I'm not asking any Christians. I'm just saying even, even you could like, you know, it's like some right on the cross or the long hair and the beard and the whole thing, right? There's a, an image or whatever. And what is so profound about Mahayana Buddhism is that they're very into a, a non- physically recognizable enlightenment in that way. So very interesting idea. It's definitely where, um, you know, a lot of the sutras in here and, and I myself dharmically, it's, it's where we stand firmly on this idea of the, of the Buddha or the Tathagata being neither male nor female. <laughs> it's because of the wis the Bodhisattva wisdom that if you, think of the buddha in physical form you failed the buddha test <laughs> so just some com commentary on that one and then the very 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 last thing that these uh, bodhisattvas do is that they traverse all buddha lands without moving in the dharma dot two Michael, what I, I found so interesting of this whole paragraph that is, you know, overall speaking, you could say that um, they acknowledge the, so to speak, relative reality, you know, we perceiving. So they acknowledge it. They, they meet the bodhisattvas where they are or us where they are, right? So they, they're not just like, you know, everything is just an illusion and blah, blah, you know, so they meet. But at the same time, always in the second sentence, is they they break our concepts and, and attachment to this um you know three dimensional um view with um with the ultimate the high highest view yep. so there's this pattern right so i think it's um yeah it's really beautiful i, I agree <laughs> yeah jenny and it's so interesting to be hearing this now when here we are on Zoom and we are like just a bunch of selfies. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been talking about that. Um, this is a fun one because we didn't get to really dive into the idea of dharmas as the ideas, which are the mental phenomena in that way. But it is, you know, and I did try to speak to it a little bit when I brought back the mental 45 right the mental 45 record which is not visible but is in your mind it's a funny thing about this world that the 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 new world we live in you know because we only got we only have two maybe three senses now we used to have six right and so i don't get to smell you i don't get to touch you i don't really get to feel you in that way i still got sound i still got that right what what i think is a really uh, this is a fun one let's play uh, we'll play this one right this is the the virtual world the internet of course is an amazing little microcosm of the dharmadatu 
I don't use it as a upaya or as a teaching device as much as I used to, actually. I used to really lean into it. But of course, what's really interesting about this auditory phenomena that you're experiencing, which is my voice, and this visual phenomena that you're experiencing, it's of course very interesting that they are generated by the same uh, electrical phenomena. So they are sort of kind of oddly like the same, but then your mind is sort of deciding what it is you're hearing versus seeing. But then there's that wild Dharma dot two realm, that crazy Dharma realm where sound and sight are equally phenomena in that way, right? And that, by the way, because I didn't do it, might as well do it now, a, a teaching like tonight, some, some weird ideas I just dropped on you like just now, that is, you know, that is for our next lesson on this idea of mind-only Buddhism, the Vijnanavada, Chitta Matra, Yoga Chara, all these different names for the idea of all phenomena is ultimately this kind of mind discriminatory phenomena. And that was present a little bit in our 12 link chain of causation lesson last week, which was that actually the thinking happens first and then the discrimination about whether I saw it or heard it. But that discrimination of, oh, that was a vision. That was a sound is actually after it. But the deluded mind thinks it's, no, 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 that was a sound and this is a sight. But this is a great example of how those are all, uh, again, internet, in electricity is wild that way. Right? Questions and answers and ideas about mind-only Buddhism as it pertains to the internet. <laughs> I, I'm getting a little punchy, which means we should probably go for like another half hour and get really wild. But no, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, Good idea. <laughs> Wait, um, so are you going to do mind only Buddhism next week? Is that what you're saying? I don't. I'm always doing mind only Buddhism. <laughs> and um, on that note, on that note, I do want to. I want everybody to know that we're sticking with this uh, heap of jewels. It's just too rich. Uh, in, that, in that sense. And so I haven't chosen exactly which sutra. There's a number I've been toying around with, but this sutra has been so fun. I haven't, you know, enjoyed it so much that I haven't wanted to, my mind to be divided. So I have been right with lightning attainment. Um, oh, and by the way, just on that last note, uh, I hope everybody caught how 500 other bodhisattvas achieved the lightning samadhi. Mm. Yeah, I know. So, you know, to be continued on that, but of course in the Mahayana tradition, there are all these poetic names for these different samadhis, these different uh, um, concentrations. And this one is about lightning. Well, I didn't introduce Indra's net, internet, and electricity, and the equalization of all phenomena through electricity for nothing. That's sort of an opaic way of thinking about the lightning samadhi, which is sort of this more uh, instantaneous electric realm of reality that we live in. That is the Dharmadhatu. <laughs> So on that note, I'm going to call it a night, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this has been great. What can I say? Thank you, Michael. I'm just going to say a couple of words to everyone. Michael, you yeah. are amazing. That's an understatement. Uh, I look forward to every week. And uh, uh, this was a beautiful sutra. And... Uh, just uh, very, very, very much worth spending five weeks on. So thank you for that. Um, one of the things that struck me there was uh, the giving and, and kind speech and volunteerism and cooperation as a means of unification. And I just want to uh, just say that, um, you know, the Dharma Collective 
used to bring us together physically in the building. Now we come together, you know, here online. And it, it, I know it helps me every week to have this to, to look forward to. So, um, yeah, so uh, San Francisco Dharma Collective, everyone here is an old timer. I will not go into details about who we are, but I will say that even though we are um, virtual, we still rely on donations to uh, pay our teachers, including MC here. And um, we are all volunteer run. So if you'd like to volunteer, get in touch. You know where to reach us. And if you can support the Dharma Collective and our teacher and Michael by donating tonight, we would be very grateful for that. Um, the only thing I want to announce in terms of upcoming things is that we're continuing with the wise action. If you haven't been, it's been phenomenal. It's really been uh, some of that nitty gritty of, you know, when, the, well, let's see, what is it? Not the, when the Dharma hits the something, like, what, what does it actually, you know, we've been studying sutras, we've been sitting, we've been meditating, but what does it actually mean? in this really crazy world that we're living in. So um, we've had different teachers every week. And this coming week, um, Niels Heyman is going to be talking about responding versus reacting. So it should be really amazing. And uh, we have more teachers coming up, including eventually Michael. So check it out. Check out our schedule online. And I um, hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Noah. Um, Thanks, guys. Good. So great Thank seeing you. everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Mike.